Hi, this is Dennis. So, yeah, I am a bit of a dog behaviour nerd and animal behaviour nerd in general. So, I used to teach veterinary science students first year vet school principles of animal behaviour for years and haven't done any teaching for a while and thought I'd post some stuff online about some topics. Um, skipping ahead a bit here, so this is not an introductory lecture at all that I'm giving. It's quite advanced. It's an advanced learning theory discussion. And it arose because I do some content writing for um, a, a Delta Dog Training Institute. And some of the courses, some of the course content in there um, needed to be updated. And so I helped with developing it and in bringing everything up to speed, got bogged down in some of the um, unfortunately some of the terminology that's a little bit unclear when it comes to behavior science so today i'll be going over trying to get into the weeds of the behavior theory and trying to demystify sensitization and some of the problems that i have with trying to teach it and getting people to understand it because it can be quite um quite confusing on some levels so i'll start off with the problems um so before i'll go into a little bit of definitions later, a little bit of more information on the theory. Um, so we'll cover this again later. So if it doesn't make sense to you yet, it should later. But first up, the reason I decided to uh, write this um, lecture was that, uh, look, desensitization and sensitization, they sound like those two terms should be the opposites, right? Um, anytime you add DE in English at the start of any word, generally it means to undo what you've done, right? So if desensitization is the opposite of sensitization, then does that mean habituation is also the opposite of sensitization? So is desensitization the same as habituation? Um, because people often, I'll explain a little bit later, but people often say sensitization and habituation, you know, they are the opposites. So that's one of the main issues that's come about here. So a bit unclear at the moment, it'll make a lot of sense later. Um, and then the next question is that you can, you know, you can't you undo classical conditioning with desensitization? Isn't that how it all works, right? So doesn't that mean that desensitization is associative learning? And if it is associative learning, how can it be habituation, which is supposed to be non-associative learning? So it's a bit of a paradox. Um, it can be very confusing. Certainly confused me for a long time as well. And so hopefully I'll clear things up a little bit um, during this presentation. So when you're talking about behavior theory, the meaning of a term or a definition, it's not universal between every scholar and every person that studies it. And that can be a problem because language, you know, the whole point of a language is that you have a shared set of words that everyone has a shared understanding of what they mean. And if they mean different things with different people, that's not handy, that's not useful. Um, so an example is, you know, what if, you know, I was to say to a random person, say gift and hand them a, a, a glass of liquid. And if you're an English speaking person, you might think, oh, that's a gift of something to drink. But if you were German, you might think, oh, that's poison. I don't want to drink that, right? So it's the same word, gift, different meanings. And where different people use different meanings, there can obviously be real issues there, as you can imagine. And the same happens a lot with learning theory and, and animal behavior, unfortunately. So one of the concepts that makes it confusing is that there, I have this idea in my head, at least, of, of learning symmetry. So when you learn a concept, um, the process that your brain goes through to learn that is presumably reversible by undoing the change that got you to learn that thing in the first place. Um, so that's what I'm talking about here about these neural correlates of memory and learning. So um, if the same process backwards and forwards is not the same kind of learning, then to me that doesn't make sense. So for example, if you're going to do some classical conditioning, the first example down the bottom there, and you know, an animal is learning and become classically conditioned, then when they're learning that association and unlearning it, I feel like there should be some thing in the definitions and the terms that 
links those two together because it is the same process, just gone forwards and reverse. Um, and then, you know, sensitization versus habituation in non-associative learning is supposed to be going, you know, forwards and reverse in terms of learning or unlearning a response. But then what about, you know, sensitization versus desensitization? If we're talking about that, shouldn't they be opposites as well? So there's a little bit of confusion there that a lot of people get, and I get too, because it depends on who you ask and what term you're talking about. Um, and again, with, you know, operant conditioning as well, you think that, you know, learning and unlearning, it's it's the same process gone in forwards and, and reverse. So I kind of like the idea of having terms that talk about learning versus unlearning with symmetry. Um, and that's a big problem. And I'm going to get into why a little bit later, because it's not currently done very well. So a little stepping back a little bit just to redefine some things here um, so that we're all on the same page and so I can really explain why all these issues are issues to begin with. So associative learning, one way of thinking of that is a multiple stimulus learning because you're associating more than one thing with another thing. So associating two things could occur, so one and one but also it could be three, four, doesn't matter, but we're only gonna talk about two here because it's the same concept. Um, so classical conditioning, operant conditioning, are both types of associative learning, there's other types as well out there. Um, and I don't really like this term actually, um, and I'll talk about later, but yeah, I find that it's confusing and it's not particularly useful in a lot of situations and it forces definitions into categories that don't make sense as I'll explain later on. So, Briefly going over classical conditioning the way I like to define it at the moment, which changes as I learn more and grow. Um, but basically you have the unconditioned stimulus, which produces an emotional response, like food causing hunger. Um, we're just gonna use Pavlov's dog here just because everyone knows it, but you know, there's a million examples. Um, a neutral stimulus, which is a bell, no emotional response initially. Pair the two together and eventually bell plus food causes hunger in the dog every time you pair it. And then eventually you don't even need the food anymore. You just ring the bell and the dog feels that hunger, that emotional response. So I like to think of it as emotional learning through pairing. Um, and it's considered associative learning fairly uncontroversially by everyone that defines it because there's two stimuli involved, the neutral and the unconditioned stimulus. Um, but I think that the real association that's going on here is not the in terms of what the, happens in the brain, is that the brain isn't really pairing the neutral and the unconditioned stimulus. It's actually pairing the neutral stimulus with the emotion that is formed from the unconditioned stimulus, which explains again why I have problems with the issue of associative and non-associative learning as definitions later on. Um, but yeah, I thought that's something that, you know, that's how the brain does it. Um, it doesn't, you know, try to pair the the bell with the food and then through the bell pair the food with the hunger or something like that. Like it just notices that every time the bell rings, the animal's feeling hungry and it just makes that association. Um, the food is actually not a stimulus that needs to be associated with the bell. It's the emotion that the food causes that is actually associated. So operant conditioning is also associative learning. Not really gonna go over that here. Again, this is not a basic uh, seminar. This is advanced theory. So hopefully you guys can all understand that and it's not really that pertinent to this. So now into non-associative learning. So this is defined as single stimulus learning. It common, commonly gives the examples of habituation versus sensitization, which is where you get like, reduced or increased response to a stimulus when it's presented repetitively. Um, it is, uh, so the question here I've written is, is it non-associative if an emotion is associated with the stimulus, right? I think that's a bit confusing, but at the moment, most people and most definitions say, it doesn't matter if there's any associations between the stimulus and an emotion, like, you know, fear of seeing an unfamiliar dog or something like that. It doesn't matter. They say it's one stimulus. That's all that counts. Even though in my mind that that's an association. Um, and so what 
I actually do for teaching is I like to clarify this into two types of uh, habituation and sensitization, depending on whether we're talking about emotional or stimulus. And I'll explain that in just a second, but basically breaks into stimulus habituation and stimulus sensitization, and then emotional habituation versus emotional sensitization. So stimulus habituation is really easy to explain. This is the classic example of the train going past your house every day and you learn to ignore it because the sound of the train doesn't mean anything. It's a useless information for your brain. So your brain learns to filter it out because it's just not useful. It's that simple. There's no emotion that needs to be associated with this for your brain to do it. Um, it's just a stimulus, a sound that is just filtered out, useless like noise, like white noise that your brain just removes because it doesn't predict anything useful for you. So why would you want to notice something more if it's got no use in your life? And that's what this is. And then stimulus sensitization, right? This is where I start to have a problem. So if you've got a single stimulus that does not have an emotional response attached to it, like the train that we were talking about, just the sound, and you are repeatedly exposed to it, can you learn to respond more to something that has got no significance to you? And what will be the usefulness of that? So, you know, if you learned to notice and respond more to something that didn't warrant a response because it was just background noise, then how does that make any sense? Why would you start to notice it more? So just imagine like, you know, if you're at a house and you're, you've already become habituated to the sound of the train track, your brain just decided to swap and start sensitizing to it, right? What would be the point of that? It's useless information, we've established that. So I'm not even sure it's a thing or if it will be useful, stimulus sensitization, um, but it is seen in, in disease, for example, with epilepsy is one example where you can end up getting seizures due to overstimulation, um, over sensory stimulation causing more and more and more of a, of a um, response. So yeah, I got a problem with this idea, but let's go on and talk about a more normal type of sensitization, the traditional version that you probably would have heard of. And they just say, this is a common example here of a definition, non-associative learning process in which repeated administration of a stimulus results in progressive amplification of a response, right? So like I just said, if there's, like I just said before, if there's nothing actually associated with that stimulus, it doesn't make sense for you to have an increased response to it, does it? So that's where we talk about emotional sensitization here, which is termed, which is not, is a term that I've sort of come out with, like it's out there, but it's not really used. Um, and this is what people normally talk about when they're comparing habituation to sensitization. Um, so they call it non-associative learning, even though it is associating an emotion with a stimulus. They just say that, no, no, the, this, that association was already there. It's just getting stronger or weaker, that association. I don't know, terminology, I think. You know. um, yeah, so here's some examples. So uh, this emotionally charged stimulus is experienced. Example one, a thunderstorm, you know, causes moderate fear in a dog. Example two, a novel food dog or human, you know, mild enjoyment when, when it's tasted. Repeated exposure to that stimulus over time, you can sensitize, right? So a thunderstorm can start to elicit greater and greater fear in an animal as they hear it multiple times over weeks and years. So that happens, right? Causes issues, obviously, but it doesn't have to be bad. So over time, if you have a food that originally you're like, eh, not that great, you can learn to love it, right? You can sensitized to the enjoyment of the food, right? So that emotional response becomes more and more over time. And there's heaps of examples. These are just two, pretty much there'll be exceptions, but pretty much any emotion that can be elicited by a stimulus can in some situation be sensitized to or the opposite, which we're about to talk about. All right. So yeah, this is defined as non-associative. Um, and yeah, so that's what you'll normally see out there when, you, when people talk about sensitization. So then what about emotional habituation um, as a post-emotional sensitization? So in this, an example here is in another different dog. So most dogs that hear the sound of a thunderstorm, they might get a little bit scared the first time they hear a crash of thunder or something but then they learn that it's okay. Nothing bad happens afterwards and they habituate to that thunderstorm, 
right? So they get reduced um, reduced emotional response over repeated exposure, right? So that's habituation, emotional habituation. Now, isn't this just desensitization, right? Good point. I'll explain it later. It kind of is. Um, it kind of is just the same as emotional habituation and desensitization, right? But then the thing is that desensitization is not the same as stimulus habituation, where you're just filtering out noise, basically, a stimulus that's useless for you. So back to these problems again, like I said before, maybe this makes a bit more sense now. Um, so, you know, how can we answer these questions? All right, so this desensitization, the opposite of sensitization, sure sounds like it from the names to me, right? Is habituation the opposite of sensitization? Yeah, see, there's a lot of stuff. Well, we're gonna unpack it in the next slide. This framework I find that I, I wrote up here is makes it much easier to get wrap your head around the whole thing, at least for me. So on the outside at the top, well, at the top there in blue, is habituation and sensitization. And they're written down as like the classic uh, non-associative learning groups that are given when people define non-associative learning as habituation versus sensitization. And then what I've done is I've broken it down on the side there into stimulus habituation and stimulus sensitization and emotional habituation and emotional sensitization. So if you look at the intersection between the column and the row, you can see all four of those are there. And then, so my definitions of stimulus habituation, stimulus sensitization, I've then written in the italics, the commonly used definitions that you'll find out there. And this is basically um, how people define it. Um, in use in learning theory textbooks and stuff like that. Although I'm not sure they all understand that this is what they've done, but this is yeah basically what it actually means. So if you're talking about habituation, most people are just talking about stimulus habituation, like the train that keeps going past your house, right? And most people, when they talk about sensitization, they're, they're talking about yeah, emotional sensitization, not stimulus sensitization. Okay, so yeah, confusing. So Let's talk about, dig into this a little bit more. So is desensitization the opposite of sensitization? Well, yeah, it is in this, from what I've seen here, yeah, it is. And is habituation the opposite of sensitization? Well, that depends on what definition you're using. But as you can see here, if you're just using total like habituation, in terms of all habituation, whether it's a stimulus or an emotion, then yes, that's the opposite of sensitization, whether stimulus or emotion. But if people are then giving an example of habituation that is just stimulus habituation, for example, they can't then go and give a sensitization example that is emotional sensitization, because that doesn't make sense, right? In my opinion, like stimulus habituation and sensitization are true non-associative learning because there's nothing associated with them. There's no emotion associated with them. But desensitization and sensitization, they do have emotions that are associated with them, right? So um, is habituation the opposite of sensitization? That depends on your definition, right? And is desensitization equal to habituation? again, depends on what definition you're using. Um, very confusing, depending who you're talking to. So the next thing that this often makes me wonder about is with classical conditioning as a learning process, right? You can undo it with desensitization, right? And like I said before about learning symmetry, you know, you'd think if you wanted a useful term that you were using, that there'd be a word for learning and unlearning in terms of the same type of learning. So with classical conditioning and desensitization, it's both emotional learning. You're learning to form a connection or unform it. So isn't then a desensitization a form of associative learning if you're undoing the classical conditioning? And isn't classical conditioning then where you're learning to make an emotional response on a stimulus, isn't that just the same as sensitization to some degree? Um, because if you look at it just from the point of view of the neutral stimulus, the neutral stimulus acquires a stronger and stronger 
res emotional response to the stimulus over time, right? Now, the only reason that we're calling it um, associative learning is because we're adding in an unconditioned stimulus. But, you know, is that enough, right? Is that enough? I don't know. It, it Again, it just it's how these words have been written. It's how it's been defined. It is confusing. But, yeah, basically, um, just to remind you guys again, basically, you've got these two stimulus that are paired together. And when they're paired, the dog starts salivating and eventually it salivates just with the bell itself only. So you can undo it with desensitization where you ring the bell and then there's a conditioned response, but eventually if you ring it enough, the dog gets used to it and it desensitizes, right? So in this case, there really is only one stimulus, right? There is a, an association with, uh, um, with an emotion of, of hunger that's there and that association between the stimulus and the hunger reduces with repeating right so this is also you could define it as um, emotional habituation right which is within the habituation column of what everyone else calls habituation so so based on their definition I think that yes desensitization is a type of habituation it is a single stimulus learning and that essentially the issue, like I said before, is with the idea of that we have been forced into breaking up our definitions into associative and non-associative learning. So, um, desensitization, like I said just before, is single stimulus learning, which is non-associative. Okay, so emotional habituation, right? So, one stimulus presented less and less and less of an emotional response okay now desensitization isn't often grouped under habituation as a non-associative learning process but again this is why i've had this issue in the first place because the way that people teach it it doesn't make logical sense when you look at everything all together individual definitions make sense but if you try and get them all to work in one big sort of formula there's contradictions right so um yeah it's i told you we'd be getting into the weeds and this is definitely uh, an advanced topic but i think that if you can if you're if you're struggling to understand this and it's and it's confusing then that's good uh that means that you're at the level where you are not simplifying things too much because if you've come into this thinking that you understand all of learning theory and sensitization it all makes perfect sense then you're kidding yourself because it's it's not that simple and like i said the reason is that people have started off and given unclear definitions and terms to things that contradict so my thoughts overall are that associative and non-associative learning is confusing and not a useful term and it's caused a lot of these contradictions in definitions that i've been speaking about um, I think all emotional learning that associates a stimulus with an emotion should be considered associative learning. It makes sense to me. You're associating one thing with another. Pretty much all learning makes associations between things. And I think that that definition of trying to break down learning into associative, non-associative is, it doesn't reflect what's actually going on in the biology unless you want to talk about non-associative learning as just being stimulus sensitization and stimulus habituation because in that case there is no association it is just one stimulus with no emotional connection at all and in that case yeah i think that can be considered non-associative learning and it does make sense but that's not what other people use so i can't use that either and i don't think people should go around there making up their own definitions you've got to use what's out there I'm just trying to explain that there's a lot of problems with what's out there already. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, the only learning we define should be, yeah, that's what I just said. So point four, um, neurologically, emotional sensitization is, I think, the mechanism that drives classical conditioning. Um, 
which should be another lecture. But essentially, even though classical conditioning is called associative learning because there's two stimuli there, what really matters, in my opinion, is the emotion that's caused by the unconditioned stimulus, not the presence of the unconditioned stimulus itself. So if you could magically make that emotion appear and then be paired with the neutral stimulus, then you're going to get exactly the same learning. So if you can get, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming quite theoretical, but I think it's important for understanding the way things work to break it down this way. So anyway, I told you we get into the weeds <laughs> and that, yeah, I told you I'm a go, uh, dog behavior geek and a dog behavior nerd. And I'm sorry there are no clear, simple answers of how you should correctly define some of these things. And part of the issue is that when you get look out at the different definitions, like they often contradict themselves, the ones that are out there and different textbooks and different people and different places and different links have all got slightly different definitions and they often are quite different to one another and contradict each other a lot. So yeah, it's a minefield out there, but thankfully, you know, you don't need to, um, you know, be working on the level of this detail from day to day, but it's just really good to think about it once in a while and then make sure that you're happy with your definitions that you're using, or maybe that you're teaching, and with the definitions that your students perhaps might be using as well. So yeah, that's it. And yeah, feel free to contact me. Um, you can follow my YouTube on Abadog, which this is from, and you can also have a follow me on Twitter as well, which would be great. And yeah, um, got a new book coming out soon as well. So I'll announce that on Twitter as well. So follow me for updates on that. Thanks everyone, have a good one.